So in terms of state attorneys general, one of the reasons we wanted to have this panel is because it's one of those elected offices that I don't think people pay a ton of attention to. You know, we elect them every four years, every two years if you're in Vermont. But it's, it's high up on the ticket, but it's not like governor or congressperson or senator. And so we felt like it just bore a little more picking apart, like a little bit of just the, the schoolhouse rock, you know, civics 101 of what AGs actually are. Also, attorneys general are involved in a lot of litigation right now. Since 2017, upwards of 50 lawsuits have been filed against the Trump administration over everything from immigration to abortion policy to the Affordable Care Act. There have also been lawsuits filed against the Affordable Care Act. So this is changing the role of state attorneys general. And these three state attorneys general are going to help us think through what that is and consider maybe if that's the right role or perhaps if that role should shift. Sitting closest to me is Ellen Rosenblum, the Attorney General of the state of Oregon, elected as a Democrat first in 2012 and then re-elected in 2016. She's a former federal prosecutor, state judge, and assistant U.S. attorney. Ellen, welcome to the program. Thank you. Next to Ellen is Phil Weiser, the Attorney General of the state of Colorado, elected as a Democrat. He has served in both the Clinton and Obama Justice Departments. He has clerked for Supreme Court Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Byron White and became Colorado's Attorney Attorney General in January. Phil, welcome. Great to be here. And next to him is Mark Bernovich, the Attorney General of the state of Arizona, elected as a Republican in 2015, re-elected last year. He's former Assistant U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona, former Assistant Attorney General with the Arizona Attorney General's Office. Mark, glad to have you with us. Thanks. Let's start with just some of the basics, and I'd love to hear from all three of you about what is what the guiding principles are that guide your work. When you go through your jobs, regardless of what it is you're doing, are there one or two kind of top line goals, principles, ethics, values that govern what you do as an attorney general? Uh, Ellen, why don't we start with you? We'll just work our way down. Good afternoon. It's great to be here, everyone. Uh, a lot of people think of us as the top cop. Since I became Attorney General, and maybe because I'm the first woman to be Attorney General in Oregon, I gave myself a new moniker. I'm the mama bear, <laughs> looking out for my cubs, protecting my people, making sure that especially the most vulnerable in our communities are looked after. That is pretty much my mantra, and of course, taking care of our precious environment. I come from a beautiful state like many of you, all of you really. We all have the beauty in our states. We want to protect our environment. So we're taking care of our resources. We're taking care of our people. We're looking out for harms. And we're, of course, following the rule of law. Phil, what about you? We started with the question about what's our overall vision and came up with, together, we serve the people of Colorado, protecting our democracy, advancing the rule of law, promoting justice for all. And we do that with four core values. We're principled, we're public servants, we're innovative, and we're better together. We're living the moment, David Cohen referred to this, where our democracy and the system of the rule of law is being tested. We believe that our office, by acting with integrity to the rule of law, by working hard in a collaborative way to solve problems, can help demonstrate how our democracy can work. Mark? Uh, let me begin by saying, first of all, thank you all for being here. This panel. I know that when I saw today's agenda and schedule, I, I saw Matt Ryan is speaking the quarterback for the Falcons, and I thought, oh my goodness, I need to go to that panel. <laughs> and then I realized I have to be here. So thank you all for being here instead of listening to Matt Ryan. So Sorry. I will I will try to be as entertaining as he is. Um, but uh, let me. I don't think there's a, there's a, a simple answer to that. Um, and, and because I think all of us have different experiences when we came to this job, but we all, all three of us and many of our colleagues have a passion um, for giving back to the community. When I first ran for Attorney General, I had never run for office. In fact, quite frankly, I have a great disdain for most politicians. Um, if you hear me talking about, especially Congress and um, some other pol political figures, even within my own party, um, I'm always, uh, sometimes I'm disgusted by what's happening. But the person, my predecessor, was an attorney general, and he was mired in scandal. There was all sorts of ethical issues, FBI investigations, and I was a career prosecutor. My wife is a prosecutor. She's now a federal judge, and we have a circle of friends. We were all like, this is crazy. How can you have the state's chief law enforcement officer 
constantly being mired in scandal or their ethics being questioned. Because when you're the government, and this is maybe because I'm a first generation American and my family fled communism, but when you're the government, you have the ability to take away people's livelihoods, their life, their liberty and property. So we have to hold, quite frankly, especially prosecutors and AGs, to a higher standard. And so um, I got in the race and I was fortunate enough to win. But throughout that race, I kept saying, your role, your role when you're the Attorney General is to do one thing, and that's to seek justice. And when you're the government, you can never count success in terms of wins or losses, um, or amount of money that's been won or lost. It's not like a private firm. Um, it's different. Success, what matters is, has justice been done? And so one of the first things I did when I became AG is throughout our building, whether it's in the restrooms, the elevators, the building you walk in, there are quotes about justice from Martin Luther King Jr. to Gandhi, um, all sorts of historical figures um, throughout the world reminding our lawyers, our investigators, our legal assistants that every day their job is to seek justice, is to seek justice for the people of Arizona. You kind of got at this with your answer just now, Mark, but I also wanted to ask everybody, you kind of alluded to this, and I'll start with you again, Ellen, about what it is that made you decide to be an attorney general. What is it that an attorney general can do, can accomplish for a state that you could not accomplish any other way? What made the AG the best avenue for what you wanted to accomplish? Well, I had no idea, of course, uh, what was going to occur in my second term. Uh, in my first term, I knew that there were going to be some really important issues, and I knew that, given my background and my experience, that I was the right person for the job. So I don't want to give you my campaign speech. I had no intention of running for attorney general, just like uh, I guess Mark didn't either. I had been a judge. I actually retired from being a judge after 22 years. But what I realized when this opportunity came along is that there's just so much that I can do and that I think I can bring my toolbox from all the different types of experiences that I've had, not to mention that there had never been a female before. I, thought, I don't want to overplay that one. But I thought that it was the time had come and the time was ripe for me to, uh, to take on this role. Now, four years ago when I got reelected, or three years ago when I got reelected, it was the same night that um, Donald Trump got elected. And suddenly I realized that there was like a whole part of my toolbox that I hadn't had a chance to use yet. But fortunately, I knew it was there, and I had the uh, kind of wherewithal, I think, to uh, not only have, the, have the, the skills to do it, but also the ability to bring people together. And so what I've really loved the most about this job, actually, has been the opportunity to work with my colleagues throughout the country. And uh, I don't get to work with Mark as often because we're different political parties, but truthfully, we work together on a lot of things, don't we? Which we, have a, we have several bipartisan uh, opportunities right now with opioids, for example. We have a big opioid investigation and potentially, hopefully, a settlement sometime that will provide monies back to our states, all of our states, for treatment and for the things that we need to help people because it's a terrible crisis. Same thing with... Um, Student debt. Student debt is a huge crisis in our country. There's 1.6, maybe it's not up to six, five, we'll say, trillion dollars outstanding in student debt. All of the AGs care about this. Bar Mark came up to Oregon for my conference a couple of weeks ago uh, and was a moderator for me. So I think it's important to note that there are certainly partisan issues, there's a lot of polarization in our country, but that state attorneys general, we're not as political, if you will, we're not as partisan as some of the other offices that people have. Maybe, maybe that's because we're lawyers. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. We're lawyers. We're about the rule of law. We're about protecting the Constitution. Every one of us has to take an oath to protect the Constitution of the United States as well as our states. And so that's what we're really all about. And we work together quite a bit. You'd be amazed. Phil, before I let you answer that question about what you could accomplish as an attorney general, could I just follow up on something you just mentioned in terms of the opioid crisis investigation? Can you talk a little bit more about how that comes together and how that works, either you or Mark, in terms of what you can bring as an attorney general or through the attorney general's office that's maybe different than what another law enforcement agency could bring or a lawmaker or the governor's office? Like how do AGs take a unique role in something like the opioid crisis? We, well, I don't want to take away from my colleagues here, but basically all of us have similar laws. We have unlawful trade practices laws in our states and we are using that part of our toolbox, our consumer protection toolbox, to bring actions against 
um, manufacturers and distributors of opioids. We've been doing this over the years. We even sued them back in 2007 and got some uh, consent decrees and various other uh, agreements, but those agreements weren't followed. So we're actually following up and bringing uh, actions to hold uh, the companies in contempt that haven't complied. So there's lots of things we can do. We also can go after them criminally. Uh, and we're doing that as well. And we have a lot of major, I think uh, my co my, our colleague, Maura Healy, just announced a big uh, uh, bust in uh, Massachusetts that's connected with opioids. So there's lots of different things we do because we are both prosecutors on the criminal side as well as on the civil side. We are enforcers. Phil? Let me pick up this thread about the opioid epidemic because I think it may be the most important thing that I'm able to do. Let's assume we get this settlement against a range of actors who were completely irresponsible, lying to people about whether or not these were addictive drugs, knowing they were addictive, making a whole bunch of money, they will be held accountable. When that money comes to our states, therein lies a big challenge. How do we help people who have been so hard hit by this crisis? Not too far from here, parts of Colorado are devastated. When I was on the campaign trail talking to someone who had recovered in Glenwood Springs about the lack of drug treatment options. This is something that we can work on here together in Colorado, build sustainable drug treatment. It will all go through our office, because we're the ones who will bring this lawsuit and help create this remedy. With respect to what motivated me, I've always been called to serve. I, I felt that way when I was undergraduate student at Swarthmore College. That's where I knew I wanted to go, because like Mark, I'm an immigrant story. I'm a first generation American. My mom and grandparents came here after surviving the Holocaust and was, they were liberated by the US Army. And they wanted to come to the United States of America because they believed in what this country stands for and in what is actually Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's favorite quote from the Bible, we are all called to justice, justice shall you pursue. I've been someone who's always looked, how can I contribute to social justice? What can I do? That's why I went to law school. That's why I clerked for judges, worked for the US Department of Justice, and served at the University of Colorado Law School in a different world where Hillary Clinton became president, I might have been serving in that administration uh, for a third time in Washington, but we weren't in that world. And in this world, if I wanted to serve, I had to run to be attorney general, because I knew this was an incredible opportunity to use law to solve problems, not just the opioid issue, but criminal justice reform, how we manage our water, a range of challenges. We are at the front lines with tools to actually do things. And at a time when Washington is so polarized and dysfunctional, we're in a unique situation to address issues effectively in an engaged, collaborative way with our communities. I do want to get to some of the way that attorney generals address gridlock in Washington. That's a big part of what we want to discuss. But Mark, I wanted to give you a chance. If you wanted to chime in at all about the way that the pursuit of the opioid crisis affects Arizona, I'd, I'd love to hear from you on that. Yeah, let me, let me well, maybe take a step back from that mm -hmm. too, just kind of even almost finish the, the last answer is that one of the things that a lot of folks, like I remember when I first got elected AG, my sister-in-law was a very smart person and you know, has got a uh, graduate degree, said, what exactly does the AG do? I mean, and so I think there's a lot of things people don't appreciate. And so sometimes when I'm out and about talking, I always tell folks that we are the largest law firm in the state of Arizona by number of lawyers in, in the state, but we also do things that touch people's lives every day. And I know all three of us, we have situations where we have to represent government agencies. When the state gets sued, we have to defend the state whether we like it or not. We have criminal jurisdiction in, in many states and over issues like on drug trafficking, drug cartels, and organized crime. Um, and we also do, we have civil division um, that not only provides advice to agencies, but also is involved in civil litigation. And so our civil litigation, Cybit AG, has, has been very, very busy, especially for the past. And it's not only because we have uh, two major lawsuits that we've done against the opioid manufacturers. One was a company, um, it's still ongoing, so everything I say about any of the opioid manufacturers just put the word allegedly in front of it so I don't get sued by them. Um, but, um, but, but this manufacturer had, um, was, was one of the doctors actually is cooperating now with us. They were paying, they were paying doctors to prescribe a fentanyl-based drug um, and then they were actually pretending the manufacturer of the drug was calling the insurance company, making misrepresentations as to the illnesses patients had, basically saying that they had some sort of terminal cancer or some sort of other major diseases in order to get 
the insurance companies to pay for these drugs, which are sometimes ten, twenty thousand dollars a month. And so that has an impact on all of us in so many ways. Not only what Phil said about drug treatment and drug addiction and how that affects all of our communities, but even when it comes to the cost of health care. When people, when you know, health, private health insurance companies are having to pay ten and twenty thousand dollars a month for medicine that may not be needed, that has an impact on all of our our, our quality of it and uh, medical care we're given and the quality of the drugs. But the other thing, the other thing in the civil litigation unit, so you hear about some of that high profile stuff, but there are other ways that the state AGs have been really engaged using those consumer protection laws. Um, you know, you may have recently seen or heard about uh, the successful lawsuit against Volkswagen, when Volkswagen was making misrepresentations on um, our carbon emissions, fuel economy, horsepower in their cars, there was a multi-state litigation where a bunch of the AGs got together and by using that being together, that becomes a force multiplier and makes it more effective to get people's attention, even the federal judge's attention, in order to successfully uh, you know, make, uh, go forward with those lawsuits. I will say in the Volkswagen case, we actually were part of the federal lawsuit, but we actually sued them in state court. And this is one of the things where the states have a lot of power, the AGs. Our consumer protection laws in some states are extremely friendly. And so we sued Volkswagen in state court as well, saying that they violated our consumer protection laws by making misrepresentations. They tried to get those lawsuits dismissed, saying basically they had been preempted by federal law and the federal law controls you know, emissions and everything else. And our argument was, no, no, we're not disputing what the emission standards should or shouldn't be. What we're saying is when you advertise, when you did print advertising, when you ran commercials in Arizona, you said the cars, this was the, carbon footprint, this is the gas mileage, and you lie to our consumers. And there's got to be accountability for lying, lying to people when, when you're a, a major corporation. And, and we successfully, they tried to get it dismissed, they didn't. We ended up settling with them for uh, in just state court for an additional $40 million. So every person that bought a Volkswagen in that category in Arizona ended up getting um, a partial refund. And so I think that that's one of the things that AGs do. If we're doing our job well, People shouldn't even really think, oh, that guy's Republican, she's a Democrat, or vice versa, whatever. If you're doing your job well, people should walk away saying, that person's fighting for Arizona consumers, or Oregon consumers, or Colorado consumers. Because I think that's one of the most important things we can do. I always say, we're the people's lawyer. People, a lot of times, it's, if you all wanted to sue Volkswagen, that's a tough row. You want to sue the opioid, it's, it's tough. These, a lot of these lawsuits would be almost impossible or impractical if you're an individual trying to engage in you know, suing some major corporation. Let me just check in with everyone here, if, see if anybody's got like a good question that's percolating that you might want to share. Anyone got something good? Okay, one or two. All right, I'll come to you in just a minute. We'll start moving microphones around. For the benefit of those who may be listening on Aspen Public Radio, I should remind you that you are listening to the panel, The New Power Players, State Activism and the Rebirth of Federalism. We're speaking to Mark Brnovich, the Attorney General of Arizona, Ellen Rosenblum, the Attorney General of Oregon, and Phil Weiser, the Attorney General of Colorado. I'm Joshua Johnson, the host of 1A on NPR, which you can hear on Aspen Public Radio weekday mornings from 9 to 11. Let's talk about the intersection between your job and federal politics. Ellen, you mentioned that when you were reelected in 2016, the election did not go quite the way you expected. How did that change the way you conceived of your job? You've been party to some lawsuits against the Trump administration's policies, but did you see that coming on election night, or did it kind of dawn on you over time that there are things going on in Washington that I'm going to have to punch back against? It took a short while. But it really hit us on January 27th of 2017. You may recall that date. It's indelibly printed on in my brain. That was the date that uh, President Trump issued his first executive order, the travel ban. And I was at a meeting of Democratic AGs, actually, in Florida that particular day. And the fall, that was a Friday, I believe, maybe a Thursday. Monday morning, the first lawsuit was filed in federal court in the state of Washington against Donald Trump and that executive order. Pretty much from then on, folks, we've been checking our Twitter feed every morning. We've been checking to see uh, you know, what's the next uh, thing coming our way. Uh, initially, it felt a lot like sort of that whack-a-mole. Uh, we've gotten better organized. I will say that Mark is not a part of the meetings, but and that's, again, because of this divide, which is unfortunate, but the reality uh, every Tuesday morning, I meet by phone with all of my Democratic colleagues around the country. And we talk 
about what we need to do to work together to make sure that we are protecting our states, our constituents, and making sure that the harms that are coming to them through these actions coming from Washington, D.C., are properly uh, attacked, quite frankly, by whatever it is we need to do. It may not be a lawsuit. It may be a comment letter to a federal agency. It may be a sign-on letter. It may be just kind of waiting uh, until we see what the next uh, step is going to be. It takes some time. A lot. I tell, I tell law students that I talk to uh, now, please don't neglect administrative law as a course. It's a very, uh, for those of you who are lawyers in here, it's kind of boring, administrative law, no more. It's the most important course you can take, that and con law in law school, because just about everything coming out of Washington involves some kind of administrative action. And we need to, what we're trying to prove in these cases is that the action that the federal government is taking is a violation of due process, it's in violation of their congressional authority, it's arbitrary and capricious, and that's where we've been successful. We have been successful in nearly all of the cases that we have brought against the federal administration because we're lawyers and because we are protecting our people based upon the Constitution and based upon essentially the Administrative Procedures Act which is, turns out to be a pretty important law. Phil, you were elected in January. You became a Colorado's Attorney General in January, so you took your office after, after the midterms. As I understand, you have already filed or signed on to at least eight lawsuits against the Trump administration on varying, varying fronts. I, I wonder why you've, I don't want to say focused on that, but why so many? Isn't that something that maybe you could ask the governor, Jared Polis, to be active on. I don't know how you align politically, but you could maybe support him in doing that, or Colorado's congressional delegation, or Colorado's senators. I mean, why does it have to be the AG's office? So a couple points here worth surfacing. First, my job is to protect the people of Colorado. If the federal government does something that's illegal, that hurts Colorado, just as if Volkswagen does something that's illegal, that hurts Colorado, my job is to protect the people of Colorado. What's notable here, and this is back to what Mark said, a lot of people don't understand the role of the AG. On these cases, whether it's against Volkswagen or the federal government based on the actions of the EPA, it's not the governor's call. It's the attorney general's call. This is why it matters who the attorney general is, because had the attorney general been my opponent, the governor could say, this is terrible what the EPA is doing, and Colorado would be on the sidelines. That's not hypothetical. That's what happened in the prior administration, where John Hickenlooper, Jared Polis's predecessor, said, we in Colorado developed a rule protecting us from methane emissions. The EPA adopted the same rule. Two thirds of methane emissions that we breathe here in Colorado comes from surrounding states. What did my predecessor do? Did she, with the governor, say, let's stand up with the EPA to support that rule? No, she actually sued the EPA to undermine the rule that was protecting Colorado. So, it's not about who the governor is. These lawsuits are up to the AG. And what I ask on every single case, is something illegal? Does it hurt the people of Colorado? The first one I got onto, and Ellen and I were on a conference call explaining this as I was taking office, the Affordable Care Act. This is something that we just have to recognize is not normal. The US Department of Justice is making an argument that the Affordable Care Act passed by Congress, upheld by the Supreme Court, should be struck down in its entirety because there's an argument about a single provision. This is the individual mandate provision. There's an argument about whether that's constitutional. If it's not constitutional, a doctrine called the severability doctrine would say ordinarily, well, there are other parts of the law that don't have a lot to do with that. Medicaid expansion, for example. 400,000 people in Colorado benefit from that. The severability doctrine says we uphold the rest of the law. Unfortunately, our Department of Justice seeking to undermine the whole law. I want, do you want to call out there are two Republican AGs who had a lot of courage because they're going to fight this off in future primaries to say the severability doctrine has to mean the same thing regardless of what the law is. And so they might say, we think that you should strike down the individual mandate, but don't knock down the whole law. So that's an issue that deeply affects Colorado. It's a threat to the rule of law. I'm going to protect Colorado. Before I come to you, Mark, people with questions, if you would raise your hand just so we can start moving the mic. You, ma'am, in the green. And anyone over here? You, sir, in the blue open-collared shirt, which I know describes half of everybody in Aspen, Colorado right now, but you. 
before I come I, to you... I do have the official outfit on, right? Oh, exactly, right. Before I come to you, Mark, Phil, with regards to that, I can imagine some Coloradans saying, but, it, but you don't speak for me. I believe that the Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional. It shouldn't be there. Who are you as the Attorney General to make a political decision under the guise of a lawyer because you have the power? I'm sure that there are plenty of Coloradans who did not agree with you opposing the policies of a president that they chose. Well, first off, when I ran, I stated very clearly what I thought about this lawsuit. So anyone who voted for me or voted against me could have known where I stood. Number two, if people don't like a law, talk to Congress. Congress considered repealing the Affordable Care Act. They didn't. So it's not the job of the courts to undo the work of Congress. And that's what's at stake in this. Are we going to allow our system of lawmaking to be subverted by an incredibly aggressive attempt to undermine what is a popularly enacted law. So I would tell that person, if you don't like the Affordable Care Act, then lobby Congress to get rid of it. Because Congress and administrative agencies have to act according to the rule of law. And my highest value is preserving our rule of law, which is the foundation of our democracy. Ma'am, before we get to your question, let me just put one more to Mark. You were elected in 2015 before the Trump administration, re-elected last year during the midterms. You are a Republican. The Republican Party has been going through a lot of soul searching in the last few years. How has the Trump administration affected any aspect of the way you do your job? I hear you in terms of saying that there are certain things that if the Attorney General is doing his or her job right should feel nonpartisan, should just feel like they are in the best interest of Arizonans. America's not that country right now. So how do you handle that? Yeah, I, I think that's unfortunate. You know, um, when. In my inaugural address when I was reelected, one of the things I talked about that I worry about this country is that um, you know, I, I knew Barry Goldwater and I was a big fan of his, and Barry Goldwater used to always say that people can disagree, but they shouldn't be disagreeable. And I worry sometimes that some of these policy disputes we've, we've gotten into have become so personal and nasty that it's, it's really hard to sometimes work together on other issues. And it's one of the things, and, and I've also talked about, like in the AG world, for the most part, I feel like there's, this is one of the last bastions where Republican Democrats still talk about stuff and try to get some you know, commonality. In fact, I'm, a, I'm a, with a group of bipartisan group looking at the issue of internet privacy and security, dealing with some of the major players. I think that's a huge issue. We haven't even touched on it yet. Uh, but that's also a bipartisan issue. Unless we act together, nothing's going to get done because I don't have faith in Congress to do it. Um, I do think I do think it's really, really important, though, that I, I, it, it's during the eight years of the Obama administration, I think there's about 47, 48, it's some, somewhere in the 40s, lawsuits filed against actions the executive branch had taken. And that number, since the election of, of President Donald Trump, is, is more than doubled now. And so there's a lot more litigation going on um, as far as challenging what the executive branch of government may or may not be doing. And one of the things, just philosophically for me, one of my concerns has always been, um, I, I make this joke now that we are all Federalists. I mean, but, I, but I, I am a Federalist in the classic sense of, you know, when the Constitution was written, Madison, you know, they expected the states to be a check on the federal government. When they talk about checks and balances, there was going to be the, you know, executive, legislative, and judicial branch of government. But they also fully expected the states to zealously guard its powers and its authorities vis-a-vis -vis the, the federal government. This manifests itself in a lot of ways. In fact, last year, um, uh, I have an article in the Cato Institute's Supreme Court Review about a case dealing with gambling, the Christie, the New Jersey case, and where the Supreme Court overturned the federal law dealing with um, gambling because they were basically commandeering the states and forcing the states, not allowing them to um, authorize various forms of sports gambling. And the reason why stuff like that's important is because, see, I've always believed that historically, inherently, issues dealing with police power, whether it's gambling, whether it's marijuana, those were issues that were designed to be left to the states, not to the federal government. And as the federal government gets more and more involved in all these issues, it becomes bigger and bigger and more bloated and less accountable. And the framers, the framers anticipated they wanted government to be more accountable, to be closer to the people. And that way you have more input and more accountability uh, when it comes to you know, who you're voting for and how you're voting for them. And so I would say with Phil, what he talked about, when I was running for re-election, I got hammered for some of the stances I took. And it was part of the campaign. And, and so I tell people sometimes Sometimes even the local media, whatever, they'll be like, oh, why are we doing this, why are we doing this? It's like, look, we've explained why we're doing this. We just ran on this, and, and these are the issues that are important. And I'm sure that the reason why Colorado elected you know, Phil and re-elected Ellen was because 
their values or what they said they were were consistent with what people wanted out of their AG. And I do know politically sometimes you end up with this dichotomy where there's different people in different parties, governor, AG, or the Senate. Um, but I think that's because people almost want that checks and balances even within the government. And at the end of the day, and I, maybe this is way now a little off topic, is it is always interesting to me, and I'm, we'd love to talk about this as another panel, is that the, the governor is the same party as I am. And um, sometimes there's some tension there because I always say I'm the people's lawyer. I'm an independent constitutional officer. So when the governor calls and says, I want you to do this, 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 I'm like, no, 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 I gotta do what I gotta do, what my job is to, the, to uh, make sure that I'm consistently applying the law. So I wanna make sure I'm not missing your point. Before we get to yeah. your question, ma'am, it sounds like what you're kind of saying is that the focus that you had before Donald Trump was elected, hasn't shifted. It's the same that focus much? I have now. It, it, it is, and that's why even when Ellen alluded to the Administrators Procedures Act, it's funny. In my head, one of the things that a lot of folks, um, you know, intellectual, I'll call them intellectual conservatives, whatever you want to call them, on the right, true federalists, we've worried about the growth of the administrative state because what ends up happening is Congress passes a law that's vague enough, and then they have people in the executive branch implement that law, and then there's no accountability. So when some rancher in Arizona is, the EPA is not letting him build a well or something like that, he's upset, the EPA says, oh, it's not our fault, this is a law Congress passed, and the law is a little vague, and then the people in Congress will say, hey, it's not our fault, go talk to the EPA. So you end up with this lack of accountability because the federal government has become bigger and bigger and bloated, and so um, I think that consistently, I think that we need to be, skeptical, and, and as Ronald Reagan famously said, I think the most dangerous words in the English language are, I'm here for the federal, I'm from the federal government, I'm here to help. Let's get to some of your questions, please. As you ask your questions, just give us your name, where you're from, be as efficient as you can with the phrasing of your question, and we'll get to as many as we can. Yes, ma'am. Sure, uh, Marcy Hamilton, I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and I run Child USA. Um, so you probably know what I'm gonna ask. Uh, so my question for the three of you is, how have you made the decision whether or not to investigate the Catholic Church? There are 20 attorneys general in the United States currently investigating, one of them is sitting in the middle, uh, which thank you. Um, but there are 30 that aren't. The federal government has never even uttered the phrase clergy sex abuse not a senator, not a House of Representatives, not a president. So I'm just interested in whether or not you're considering this. In the interest of time, is there one person in particular you'd like to direct that question to? Because I just want to make sure we get to as many as well, we Well, I, I would be especially interested in what's going on in Arizona, because they did just pass a very good law for victims, um, and they're pretty soon going to have a lot of information about victims. Yeah, All right, sure. and worth noting, by the way, just by way of background, that the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office has basically investigated every diocese in the state of Pennsylvania and uncovered decades of abuse involving hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children that had never been accounted for and indeed had been very well covered up for a very long time by a number of archdioceses and dioceses across the state of Pennsylvania. Mark. Yeah, and, and, and the, the really the short answer to that is, I, quite frankly, I think Arizona was on the forefront of that. About 15 years ago, Arizona, there was a criminal investigation of the Catholic Church in Arizona. They ended up having a settlement um, with the state, with the Maricopa County, which is the largest county in Arizona. Um, Maricopa County's always been considered one of the toughest uh, leading edge counties when it comes to crimes against children, exploitation of minors. I know our office has recently prosecuted um, cases, um, including you working with stings of people that were trying to solicit um, or uh, <coughs> solicit inappropriate relationships, um, exploit minors, and so we have been doing things, but the reality is, is that Arizona had a reckoning with the Catholic Church about 15 years ago, and there's still a consent decree on that, and I always tell folks that if, there are, if there's additional information, we don't have primary jurisdiction, the county attorneys do, but we are more than willing to listen. If there's anyone that feels like they've been a victim of a crime or knows of a crime, they should contact the authorities. Ellen, and then we'll get to your question. And I feel very similarly, actually, to my colleague from Arizona. Oregon was at the forefront about that same amount of years ago. Many lawsuits were brought, and there was a bankruptcy of the uh, diocese in Portland and all kinds of involvement by the courts at that time. And I also have to add that you can't necessarily tell whether a state is investigating or not, because a lot of times they're not allowed to talk about it. Yes, sir. Jim Daly, uh, Aspen resident. Um, my question would be with respect to rise of state activism and federalism. The resources of your offices, and as a taxpayer, 
where are they being allocated with intergovernmental issues where I'm paying on both sides of the case? Because I think every time I read in the newspaper that one agency is suing another agency and I think I'm paying the bill, it's incredibly frustrating. Well, so, given that I'm your attorney general, let me answer you and maybe put your fears aside. Yeah, you know later. I was going to put that to you. Yeah, I did. There's really only one case that we as a standalone office are bringing against the federal government. It involves uh, the Tenth Amendment commandeering doctrine that Mark talked about, something that I'm very committed to because I'm also old school federalism. The federal government said to us, take for example Fort Lewis College in Durango, you're going to lose these law enforcement grants unless you tell your people to actually help us do immigration policing. And on behalf of Colorado, I want to say, you don't get to commandeer our officials and make our people do your work. The folks in Fort Lewis College don't want to be in the immigration policing business. They also don't want their grants threatened if they don't do that. And I want to say to the federal government, what you're doing is unconstitutional. I will fight it on behalf of the state of Colorado for violating the 10th Amendment. That's the only one of those nine cases that I am doing in my office alone. The other ones, like the Affordable Care Act case, California is taking the lead on. It takes a little bit of my time, a little bit of my Solicitor General's time to evaluate, does this violate the rule of law in hurt Colorado? And I'm willing to say, in that case, absolutely, sign me up. But honestly, um, I'm working so hard that it's, you know, from your standpoint, it's, you know, the extra hours above and beyond the day job to do that sort of work. And as for this one case where we are doing it ourselves, we're doing it for Colorado to protect our grants the federal government is threatened to withhold for an unconstitutional reason. Can I, we got oh, briefly, and then we're going to get to oh, our next question. Briefly. And I just want to say, I, I think that's a really legitimate concern. I think all of us get asked that at various points. Um, but one is, I think, how do you put a price on justice? And there's like, for example, in criminal law cases, especially like wiretap complex drug cartel cases, I mean, there's a lot of time and money that goes into that case that, you know, there's not like a... A, a true financial benefit at the end. Um, two, a lot of the cases that we do, for example, opioids, Volkswagen, a lot of these cases are multi-state cases. Some of the cases that you'll probably be seeing upcoming dealing with uh, the big internet companies. I mean, those are cases where you have groups of AGs, bipartisan groups, that are kind of divvying up the work, and it's because it's important to all of our consumers. And so, and I also think that if you do look, and this is not why we do this job, it's not why we do it, but when we are successful, and just, just this last week, we announced two cases where we successfully sued a company that was taking deposits for bridal dresses and skipped town. And it's, it's, in fact, I think they went to Oregon. Um, they, um, <laughs> they're no longer practicing there. They, no, but I didn't mean that in any sort of bad way. I mean, every, I, That's cool. I'm glad they Let's moved out. It's like, share. she'll go after him there. We'll but, they, but, it, but it was like 100. But so we sued them to get that money back. And it's like some people may say, oh, well, maybe they should have gotten a. But no, but it's like because it was so systematic and it was a big group of people, that became an issue of public concern. And so I think that um, when you do look at some of those cases, even like the Volkswagen case, since I've been AG, we have gotten more restitution back to individual consumers than the, the previous four administrations combined. So one of the upsides about sometimes being a little aggressive and involved in litigation um, is that you end up getting money back for your consumers and you're holding these companies accountable. So whether it's GM or Volkswagen, we have a, we, Theranos. We were one of the states that sued Theranos and, and successfully um, got refunds for all the consumers. And so I, I think that you know sometimes it's hard to put a price on that, but I think that uh, companies you can even deter bad behavior if they know that if they do something illegal or if they make misrepresentations, they could either be charged criminally or sued civilly. A few minutes left. We'll get to as many audience questions as we can. Yes, sir. Hi, Alan Shares <coughs> from Florida. As a uh, first-generation immigrant to North America, my parents are Holocaust survivors, we elected to immigrate to the U.S. 28 years ago, and we escaped Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Some people will understand that, some won't. <laughs> um, I was taken aback by, by the point Ellen made. The, the Tuesday morning Democratic state attorney general meetings, why not all the attorney generals on that Tuesday morning telephone meeting? Ellen? It doesn't sound bipartisan, as opposed to the three of you seem very bipartisan. Right, but as I said, there are unfortunately 
some areas where they simply are, we're simply too polarized. We would love nothing more than to have the Republican AGs join us on the Tuesday morning call. Uh, in fact, I'll invite Mark here publicly. <laughs> Some of our colleagues may not appreciate that. No, I, 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 I totally appreciate it. And, and I want to say, when I was working in the Department of Justice the first time in the antitrust division, there was no Democratic AGs, there was no Republican AGs, there was only a National AG Association. That was the old world. At some point, first the Republican AG started, and then the Democrats, the people thought, we got to do our own. Um, where we are right now, on an issue like the Affordable Care Act, there are some Republican AGs taking the same position. We need to get more around principle and work together. And I'm also totally with Mark. If we disagree, we don't need to be disagreeable. Work together on other stuff. Where I also think what Mark says is really important, we have to keep this bastion governed by principle, governed by collaboration, to make government work the way it's supposed to. Before you ask your question, can you teach Congress to do that? <laughs> Why is it that you can do that and Congress can't and many governors can't and the White House can't and it's like these seems to be one of the only levels of government where Democrats and Republicans can just see eye to eye out of principle. But we're, Why can't everyone well, else do that? Part is because we've got a prior commitment to the rule of law. So does Congress. So does the President. Their oath begins with I solemnly swear to defend and uphold the Constitution of the can, United States. I, Same as yours. Let me just say a couple things really quick, Joshua. The, one is just, just following up on Ellen's point. One thing I will say is that we're all involved, and I was the past chairman, Ellen's been the chairman, chairwoman before of the Western Attorney General's Association. And that's where, that's where the, a lot of the Western AGs get together. And um, a lot of times we have a lot more, in, I don't say in common, but I do think, I, I, I have one of my big running jokes has always been that you know Washington DC is where good ideas go to die. And I think that sometimes you're in that bubble, everything becomes so hyper- That's one of those jokes is hard to laugh at, but it's true, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, but everything becomes so hyper-partisan there. And just, this is totally off subject, but I, since I've been elected, I've become a huge believer in term limits. And I think part of the reason is because in Congress, what ends up happening is everyone's always running for their next office, they're running for re-election, they're trying to climb up the ladder. You know, every U.S. senator looks in the mirror and sees the next president. I mean, so, so there's all these issues where um, there's this, this overlay, and I think that's why stuff doesn't get done, because people would rather score cheap political points then get stuff done, and I think, and they, I don't know, maybe it's because we're lawyers too, and we're used to like, sometimes you litigate you know, against people, and you know, you, it may be a tough litigation, but you shake hands, and you can you understand, hey, we're, it's nothing personal. A few more questions before we go. Yes, sir. My name is Johnny, I live in Denver, uh, and I want to ask about the emphasis on financial settlements in cases of corporate abuse, and what tools you have to force other accountability. Um, take the opioid example. We were talking a lot about financial settlements. My impression is your, your, your friend on the Tuesday calls, Maura Healy, is focused on some more aggressive uh, uh, punishment of executives who were involved in that, rather than just redistribution from shareholders to taxpayers in the form of a settlement. Obviously, settlements are important and have a role, but I'd love to get a sense of what other tools you have available to force accountability. Well, sure. Well, I, I think it's important to note that while we are definitely trying to get money, dollars, so that we can bring money back to our states for treatment, for all sorts of other, you know, cessation type of types of programs, uh, both thinking back to tobacco, uh, wasn't as successful in terms of, of accomplishing that. But m even more important for state attorneys general than the money is the injunctive relief that we get. It's the actual terms of the settlement. And so you can look to Oklahoma. I don't know if anyone's here from Oklahoma. But Oklahoma is the one that got the settlement, right? Everybody's like, well, how did they get that big settlement? Well, maybe their injunctive terms weren't quite as strong as what we would want to insist upon. And that's ultimately what it matters for the future. And that's what state AGs are all about. And and so we work together as multi-state groups, all of us, when it comes to opioids, when it comes to, uh, we'll be talking more about the privacy, the internet uh, world is certainly out there and technology is, is uh, back and forth in terms of protecting our privacy and our security. You're gonna be hearing from us on that. But what we're about is not so much the money as it is about how are these companies going to correct their bad behavior? Do they actually need to be eliminated completely? Or can they stay alive? Can they stay in business, but with terms that we can all agree to? And I'll, let me just yeah. kind of add one thing to that Briefly. really quick. The, um, and what I alluded to earlier about reshaping or deterring bad conduct, I think that's part of it. And if I hear part of your question, because sometimes we get asked this, it's like, well, wait a minute, this is a civil case. Why didn't you prosecute them criminally? And I think this is all really important for everyone to appreciate, left or right. 
as I said earlier, when you've got the power of government, you know, I was just saying, the power to indict is the power to destroy. And I, it offends me. Maybe this is because of my Eastern European first generation roots. I don't want government throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks when it comes to the criminal process. Because I mean, these are people's lives and you know the livelihoods. And so, when you're, if you're a prosecutor, you have an ethical obligation. You should never indict anyone unless you believe you have a reasonable likelihood of conviction. And as you know, this, I, I think you know because we asked the question. The standard in a civil case is lower than in a criminal case. And so, when you start <coughs> indicting people criminally. You need to make sure you have all your ducks in a row. And I'm a big believer, even going back to my DOJ days, in the rule of lenity. If there's like some uh, um, confusion or if the statute isn't clear, you err on the side of the individual versus erring on the side of the government. Phil? And so, so, I, uh, so sorry. quickly, just to give you an example, we took an action by ourselves because the federal government was not acting to address a merger and impose a consent decree with requirements to protect competition and healthcare consumers. No damages at all only protections, because you're right, and what Alan said is absolutely right. First and foremost, we want to protect people. Where there's financial harm that's been done, we can try to undo it, give money back to people, or address it. But first and foremost is protecting people. One last question, ma'am. Go ahead. So there are so many topics. Oh, introduce yourself, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Carol Foster. I'm from California, and I'm a CFO. Um, there are so many things on your plate. There are so many things to choose from. How, do you, like determine, closer, how do you determine your agenda? And do you determine it by year, or you determine it for your four years? How does that work? Ellen, why don't you take that one? We all have our priorities. We have our initiatives. And I, if we try to make it very clear, I can't speak for my colleagues, but I made it very clear to my folks what those initiatives were at the outset. Now, you have to be uh, somewhat nimble, because as I said, I didn't know what was going to happen four years ago. My first four years, I was very focused on elder abuse. And I continue to be, because I was able to get funding for an elder abuse unit. Yay. So that, we're kind of, you know, we're going. I have staff, thank goodness. It's not just us. We have amazing staff who help us. I run a large agency of 1,300. I run child support. I run child advocacy, abuse and neglect. I, I uh, defend the state whenever we're sued. We have a monopoly on representation of state agencies. No one else can represent them. So the point being that we have a lot of work to do, and our priorities are pretty much set for us already in terms of our agency work and our role on that kind of side of, of, of the gold, providing the gold standard of legal services to our state. But then there's our priorities. And our priorities have had to shift. And in my case, they have shifted rather dramatically in terms of making sure that we are pushing back when our people, when I examine, and I think uh, uh, my colleague here, uh, Phil, said it as, as well as anybody could, that you look to see whether the rule of law has been violated and whether your people have been harmed. And if they have, you simply have to prioritize those cases. If I can just quickly say, for me, it's five simple things. Protect the rule of law, address the opioid epidemic, improve our criminal justice system, protect consumers, protect our land, air, and water. That's our true north. And mark your priorities before we go. Day one, we always said we're going to protect the most vulnerable. We are going to be the people's lawyer. We're going to be the voice for people that are voiceless and push back against the bullies out there, whether they're big corporations or drug cartels. Um, we're going to be the people's lawyer. Arizona State Attorney General Mark Burnovich, Colorado State Attorney General Phil Weiser, and Oregon Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum. Mark, Phil, Ellen, thanks for talking to us. Thank you. Thanks for being here, everybody. Enjoy the thanks, rest of your time at the festival.